It's like Batman stuff. Let's party. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Blue Beetle breakdown Easter eggs for the entire movie. There were a whole bunch of references to both the DCEU and James Gunn's new DCU. So if you felt like you saw a lot of Henry Cavill Superman references or Ben Affleck Batman or larger references to the Snyderverse, you're not mistaken. The director said that he put some of those in there specifically, even though the movie was intended to be kind of ambiguous. And James Gunn said the character would come back in his DCU movies. Don't worry, I'll explain everything. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. But careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the movie yet, just because we'll be talking about everything. Starting at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments as we go along. The movie has an interesting origin. Originally, they planned the movie to just be a streaming movie, like a much smaller film with a smaller budget for HBO Max when it still existed when AT&T still owned Warner Brothers in DC. The movie survived about three different regime changes at Warner Brothers because they changed hands, like now they're Warner Brothers Discovery. James Gunn came along and decided to reboot all of DC movies, but this movie had been made before he had been hired. But one of the reasons why he was so quick to include Jaime Reyes' Blue Beetle in his upcoming DC movies is because a lot of the references in the movie are kind of ambiguous, even though the director has said otherwise in some of his interviews. This is what set it apart from movies like The Flash Movie, which had lots of specific references and scenes that they filmed with Henry Cavill's Superman, Gal Gadot Wonder Woman, Ben Affleck Batman, basically all the Snyderverse characters and stuff that they had to delete or remove when the movie had been made because they didn't intend on paying off a lot of the post credit scenes. So a lot of stuff got changed for some of the other movies, including Aquaman 2, which is coming out later this year. Blue Beetle, however, was a little more ambiguous, so that just helped it survive the transition to the James Gunn DCU. So for the most part, most of the stuff in the movie will stay canon in his new DCU movies. A couple of the jokey references to like Batman and Superman, some of the things that are going on with those characters during this movie, they probably won't include that stuff though. Most of you probably remember Blue Beetle from either the classic comics. My origin with the character goes back to the original Infinite Crisis origin of the character. That's when he debuted in the comics and got the scarab. There's only been a couple live action versions of Jaime Reyes' Blue Beetle before though. Like he debuted during the Smallville episodes in the final season with Booster Gold. They're also doing Booster Gold in the upcoming DC shows. There was also a Blue Beetle spin-off TV show they tried to make for his character back during Smallville era more than 10 years ago. But at the time, they just didn't have the level of technology and the budget would have been way too high. The director said the movie takes inspiration from Young Justice Blue Beetle, like the Injustice games with his combo moves and his fights, Kamen Rider, Dragon Ball Z with some of the fights, Final Fantasy VII with his giant sword, some of his giant blasters were inspired by the Mega Man games. A lot of people also felt like they saw some Power Rangers references. It was supposed to be more like Kamen Rider, but Becky G, who was the voice of Kaja Da, the Scarab itself, used to be an actual Power Ranger. She also has a song in the movie. According to James Gunn, Jaime Reyes' Blue Beetle will come back, Jenny Cord will come back, and maybe some of the other characters, but mostly just those two. Ted Cord appears in that first post credit scene. We'll see if he comes back too. That might be another version of the character. I'm not exactly sure who the actor is in the first post credit scene. A lot of people thought that it was Jason Sudeikis because he would make an awesome Ted Cord, but that was not Jason Sudeikis playing Ted Cord in the actual movie. That was just another actor. They start the movie with a custom Blue Beetle themed DC logo made to look like the scarab effect when it takes over a host like Jaime Reyes later in the movie. The opening scene is Victoria Cord finding the scarab in the Arctic. Later we find out that Dan Garrett gave the scarab to Ted Cord years ago who had received funding from him which is right out of the comics. In the comics Dan Garrett was the professor of Ted Cord. We also see their Blue Beetle suits later in the movie too. But this means that Ted Cord is the one who hid the scarab and built these containment devices in decoys all over the world. One of the reasons why he supposedly disappeared in the beginning of the movie, like why he's been gone for a couple years, probably has something to do with Victoria Cord. The idea is that he disappeared in the late 90s and people think that he's dead. We find out in one of the post credit scenes that he's still alive, sending a distress call to his bunker for Jenny to find, but it doesn't show where he is. One of my theories is that he also started to discover the alien origins of the Blue Beetle Scarab and what's going on with the Reach, and that's part of the reason why he's gone to ground. The reason why he wasn't around in the comics when Jaime Reyes got the Blue Beetle Scarab is because he was dead, for at least a little while. They retconned this later. During the countdown to Infinite Crisis comics, he discovered that Maxwell Lord planned to use Checkmate and Brother Eye to take over the world, who then killed him. So originally in the comics, when Jaime Reyes got the scarab, it was Booster Gold who became the world's worst mentor to him, then Peacemaker, and even Guy Gardner, Green Lantern for a while. 
When he comes back in the upcoming DC TV shows and movies, he'll probably cross over on the Booster Gold TV show. Maybe a Green Lantern story. Nathan Fillion is currently one of the only ones James Gunn has cast as Guy Gardner for Superman Legacy, but Jaime Reyes won't be in Superman Legacy. They are doing the Green Lantern HBO TV show with Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart, but it's meant to be kind of like true detective in the DC universe set on Earth. I don't know if he's going to cross over onto that, but we'll see. There are only a few brief references to the other scarabs in the Reach during the movie. The biggest reference is during the opening credits right after Victoria Cord gets the Blue Beetle scarab. It shows the Reach sending all the different colors of scarabs around the universe, and it shows the origin of the Blue Beetle scarab damaging itself, which is also right out of the comics. All the scarabs are meant to look a little bit like the Green Lantern rings disseminating through the universe. Sort of like the Lantern rings from the entire spectrum of emotions. This sort of gets into the origin of the Reach and why they made the Scarabs in the first place. Thousands of years ago, the Reach conquered planets the old-fashioned way, their very warlike culture. The Green Lantern Corps stopped them, and then they were forced to find other ways to conquer planets. They developed a Scarab tech as a backdoor way around the Green Lantern's rule. They'd send Scarabs to a world, and it'd wait until it achieved a certain level of technology. Then it'd find a compatible host and act like it was a blessing, giving the person superpowers, but then eventually take over that person's consciousness, and the Reach would use it to conquer the planet, setting it up for a really easy invasion. That's why when they were promoting the movie, they said Jaime Reyes is going to be a superhero whether he wants to be or not, because basically the Blue Beetle Scarab takes over a host and does whatever it wants, or uses it kind of like a finger puppet. They'd send scarabs to a world and it'd wait until it achieved a certain level of technology. Then it'd find a compatible host and act like it was a blessing, giving the person superpowers, take over that person's consciousness, and the Reach would use it to conquer the planet, setting it up for a really easy invasion. That's why when they were promoting the movie, they said Jaime Reyes is going to be a superhero whether he wants to be or not, because basically the Blue Beetle Scarab takes over a host and does whatever it wants or uses it kind of like a finger puppet. The Easter egg in the opening credit scene, though, is that when you see the Blue Beetle Scarab arriving on Earth, it bounces through a couple different planets and it damages itself so it doesn't listen to all the Reach's commands all the time, which is why Jaime Reyes isn't instantly taken over by the Reach. They change a couple things about its origin in those opening credits, making it seem like ancient Latin American cultures were able to use it and it bonded with people in ancient times. In the comics and in the movie, it was Dan Garrett who initially found the scarab beetle on an archaeology dig, then gave it to his student Ted Cord, both of whom took the mantle of Blue Beetle and became superheroes, but neither one being able to unlock the full potential of the scarab. The Carpax villain is originally a Dan Garrett Blue Beetle villain, who then later turned into a Ted Kord Silver Age villain. In the comics, he got his suit from Ted Kord's uncle's secret lab on Pago Island, which is a location they use in the movie. There are a couple Easter eggs for this origin story. His consciousness had been transferred into the suit, allowing him a form of immortality. In the movie, it's more of like a cyborg symbiotic relationship, kind of like the Blue Beetle Scarab and Blue Beetle himself. The movie combines him with the Omac and Brother Eye storyline from Infinite Crisis, which is where Jaime Reyes Blue Beetle got his origin story. In the comics, Brother Eye was an advanced AI satellite Batman created to help defend the world more efficiently, monitoring crime all over the globe. The AI went rogue, turned villainous, hijacking Checkmate's OMAC project, the one-man army corps, and almost took over the planet, killing heroes and villains alike as Batman had programmed the satellite with everyone's weaknesses. Jaime Reyes became the Blue Beetle and helps the other Justice League characters and heroes destroy the satellite. The movie has Cord Industries under Victoria Cord develop the OMAC project. When they download the software from the Blue Beetle Scarab, they use it to finish the project, and she references how the software itself is the most important part of it. That's more of the Brother Eye Easter egg, like the software on her phone. There's also another Brother Eye Easter egg on the poster to Jaime Reyes' bedroom, just a reference to his comic book origin. Susan Sarandon's Victoria Cord is from the comic. She's Ted Cord's evil sister. She was only featured briefly, though. During the movie, she also says the company has Promethium mines elsewhere in the world. That's like the vibranium or adamantium of DC Comics, the special metal that Deathstroke's swords are made of. During the opening credits, they show Ted Kord's history as Blue Beetle, being a superhero in the 80s and 90s with his Batman-level technology like the Bug Ship, which is right out of the comics and they use later in the movie. The reference to him fighting Fire Fist was the villain from Ted Kord's very first issue in his solo comic when he debuted as the only Blue Beetle from Volume 6 Number 1 in 1986. 
in the context of the movie, this is meant to be his first appearance in universe as the character. But in the comics, Dan Garrett was the Blue Beetle for a long time through volume five, and they debuted the Ted Cord character back in 1966. It's just that Dan Garrett didn't wind up dying and Ted Cord didn't become the only Blue Beetle until much, much later. One of the other changes the movie makes is to say that Jaime Reyes and Ted Cord come from Palmera City, which is kind of like the DC Universe version of Florida. Palmera is a real place in DC Comics, though. It's not meant to be like a Ray Palmer Adam reference. Originally, he was from El Paso, Texas. There is an Easter egg for this in the movie. The family lives on El Paso Street. In the movie, he's much older than comic book Jaime Reyes. Originally, he got the scarab when he was still a teenager. In the movie, he just finished college. After attending Gotham University, he also wears a Gotham Law sweatshirt, implying that he's pre-law and wants to go back to Gotham for his law degree someday. They also make a lot of Batman jokes and references later in the movie, referencing other Justice League heroes just in general. George Lopez, his uncle, calls Batman a fascist, mostly because he's so rich and doesn't have a sense of humor because they're talking about Ted Kord being funny in the comics. His uncle's also meant to be like a crazy conspiracy theorist, kind of like Peacemaker, like basically the same vibe of the character. Little bit nutso, but in the context of Blue Beetle, his uncle is a tech genius. They use this as a running gag during the Peacemaker series too, where he makes fun of all the different Justice League heroes. The other major Batman joke reference is on the radio. There's a broadcast in Spanish that they're listening to, and the announcer reveals that Bruce Wayne has just purchased a social media platform, which is more of a real life reference to Elon Musk buying Twitter. That will probably not be canon in James Gunn's new DCU movies. Don't think Batman is going to be owning any social media platforms. There are a bunch of wider DC references in the city landscape of the buildings. There's an Ace Chemical building from the Batman comics, the Batman movies, a LexCorp building for Superman. Later in the movie, they also reference Superman, The Flash, Green Lantern. Generally, the director said all the Justice League characters were meant to be ambiguous, like they could be any versions of those characters, like the Snyderverse or the more modern DCU films that James Gunn is doing. So it's not necessarily Henry Cavill, Superman, or Ezra Miller, Flash, or Ben Affleck, Batman, but he did say, like the director did say, he specifically wanted references to Zack Snyder's Man of Steel movie because he was such a big Zack Snyder fan. So technically there are some DCEU references. Zack Snyder also came out in real life in support of the movie, which was really cool. When they're watching the news, the broadcast is from GBS, which is also from the comics. It stands for Galaxy Broadcasting System, which is run by Morgan Edge from the Superman comics. The station was also featured in the Man of Steel movie, Aquaman, the Suicide Squad movie, and the Shazam movies. Most of his family members are based on comic book versions of the characters with a few additions. His father survives in the comics, but they don't really participate in his adventures the same way. We meet Jenny Cord. She's not from the comics. In universe, she's meant to be kind of like a Bulma, Dragon Ball type of character running Capsule Corp, like a female Iron Man with a bunch of cool tech that everyone uses. That's basically the arc for her at the end of the movie. Like she ends up running Cord Industries after Victoria Cord dies and basically ending their production of weapons like Iron Man did with Stark Industries during the first Iron Man movie. Harvey Guyen plays sort of like a scientist version of Otis from the Christopher Reeve Superman movies to Victoria Cord's Lex Luthor. He winds up turning good at the end of the movie too. When she steals the scarab, she puts it in a Big Belly Burger box. Big Belly Burger is a big chain in DC Comics that have been featured a ton of times in the DC TV shows and movies, most prominently in the Arrowverse. Like multiple shows, Arrow, Flash, use it all the time. When he gets the Scarab in the comics, they didn't go full Iron Man Jarvis with the Scarab's consciousness like an AI. The movie treats it more like a DC version of Jarvis, though. Like, it is a direct reference to Iron Man. When they infiltrate Cord Industries to get Ted Cord's watch so they can get into his secret base, one of the TV shows that they use to distract the guards is taken from the stop-motion animated version of El Chapoyin Collorado. There's a longer version of this that they play in the second post credit scene. The character debuted in the early 1970s on another TV show, was huge in Latin American countries, and eventually got his own spin-off show that ran for years. In the context of the movie, it's also meant to be a reference to Jaime Reyes becoming a Latin American superhero. There were a bunch of you on my post credit scene video that commented that you actually grew up watching the character. There were even some special promotions for the movie that featured new animation with the character and Blue Beetle in the same style of the original TV show. The statue in the yard is meant to be of Ted Cord's grandfather who founded the company Cord Industries. And when Blue Beetle starts his fight with Car Packs for the first time, most of their fights just in general are meant to be a reference to Superman's Zod fight and Man of Steel, along with the moves from Injustice 2. Some of Kamen Rider, his sword is supposed to be inspired by the Final Fantasy sword, and then the blaster is from the Mega Man games. Some of the later fights turn into Dragon Ball references with Goku versus Vegeta, and also when Goku went Super Saiyan for the first time as Blue Beetle powers up in the movie a few times. 
The reason why all of Ted Kord's tech looks like it's stuck from the 80s and 90s is because it was the late 90s when he disappeared. George Lopez joking that he wasn't as good as Superman or the other Justice League superheroes like The Flash or Batman, then making jokes about his tech not always working is also right out of the comics. They always joked about Ted Kord's tech not being that great, him just being kind of like a B-list superhero, but he always had a sense of humor, which is a reference to his crossovers with Booster Gold, just like the tone in general of the classic Blue Beetle comics generally way wackier than the other DC heroes. The Blue Beetle bug ship is right out of the comics, and when they're grabbing weapons, Jaime's sister uses the NES Power Glove as a weapon. One of Jenny Kors' devices is a classic Game Boy that has a worm light. Pago Island in the comics was also where Ted Kord's uncle had a secret base and where Carpax got his origin in the comics. It's also where Dan Garrett wound up dying in the comics too. A lot of people felt like this scene of Jaime Reyes in the afterlife on the edge of death is basically the same type of scene as Rocket in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Obviously the director did not base it on Guardians of the Galaxy 3, but it's basically the same vibe with them both telling the characters that it wasn't their time yet. During the first post credit scene, there's a signal coming from inside Ted Kord's Blue Beetle cape, like his back cape, so to speak. The song All Out of Love plays because every time they go into the cave, there's always some 80s song that plays. The signal is coming from him, Ted Kord. There's a bunch of satellite signals that bounce around, like all these systems activate on the computer. And this fuzzy broadcast from him, like a message says, tell my daughter, Jenny Kord, that her father is still alive. Ted Kord is still alive. While that signal plays, the camera zooms in on that third mannequin that's black with the pillow tied around it. That's meant to represent Jenny Kord. Eventually, I think the idea was when she was younger and she would visit the cave with Ted Kord. Ted Kord had always intended for her to get her own suit and was going to make it and put it on that mannequin like the mannequin was meant to represent her eventual suit when she grew big enough. The second post credit scene is just a longer version of that animated Latin American TV show El Chapo Yin Colorado that they used to distract the Kord Industries guards. At the end of the clip you hear George Lopez's voice and he's kicking like a giant machine saying that's sexy. It's probably dialogue taken from earlier in the movie when he was distracting the guards with his machine and had to kick it a bunch of times to get it to work. Let me know where you want the character to cross over in future DC movies and shows. Maybe on the Booster Gold TV show, maybe the Green Lantern series, maybe Peacemaker season 2, but at least the next Justice League movie. He's not going to be in Superman Legacy though. Let me know in the comments if you spotted any other easter eggs or references in the movie that I didn't talk about in the video. There are a ton of very specific references, particularly to Latin American culture. Big reminder is that next week Ahsoka episodes start on Tuesday. My videos will post every week just like normal. Click here for my Blue Beetle post credit scene video and click here for that teaser for the new version of the Justice League and the new version of Green Lantern with Nathan Fillion. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.